Hello, my name is Christina McCumber, and this is my case study development project for advanced clinical procedures. My patient is a male of Caucasian descent and with a family history of al alcoholism and Parkinson's disease. He's also 72 and was a previous cocaine addict and alcoholic. He also suffered from a motorcycle accident with an impact to his teeth and skull and experiences occasional spasms at his appendages. He currently is an actor and lives by himself and has caretaker assistance. My patient presents with Parkinson's disease and also has alcoholism. He once again has spasms at his appendages due to a previous uh, motorcycle accident, but also has a caretaker for anything that he might need. His allergies are penicillin um, and his vitals are usually 120 over 80 with a pulse rate of 60 with a respiration rate of 12 and a temperature of 98.6 degrees. His classification is an ASA type 3. Um, he had a pallidotomy performed. And this is a neurological neurosurgical procedure whereby a tiny electrical probe is placed in the globus pilatus, one of the basal nuclei of the brain, which is then heated to 80 degrees Celsius for 60 seconds to destroy a small area of the brain cells. In, 1990, in 1988, he was hospitalized for the motorcycle accident. Um, and as a result from the Parkinson's disease, he has he's currently taking levodopa and benzodrapine for treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, once again, he had a pallidotomy performed as a major treatment, and uh, our preparedness for medical emergencies include possible seizures as a side effect from the pallidotomy, heavy tremors and exaggeration in movements, these are the spasms we mentioned, um, so we have to make sure that we take caution with triggers, ask, ask our patient what are these triggers if they can feel them coming on for a seizure, and make sure we have a clear space in case the uh, medical emergency presents. We also Know that he's an alcoholic, so we must refrain from using any dental products containing alcohol, as this could provoke an incident. Um, and our oral findings include poor oral hygiene and nutritional deficiencies evident by angular colitis. The medications prescribed, once again, are levodopa and benzodrapine. Levodopa is for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. The initial dose is 250 milligrams two to four times a day. We may increase this to 800 milligrams a day. Special considerations, we want to refrain from a high protein diet and vitamin C, B6 can actually reduce the effectiveness of this drug. Contraindications are allergy to levodopa, use of MAOIs, and narrow angle glaucoma. Oral side effects are clenching and grinding teeth, dysphagia, excessive watering of mouth, difficulty opening mouth, and ironically, xerostomia. For benzodrapine, is actually treat, is for the treatment of tre tremors associated with Parkinson's disease. The initial dose is 0.5 to 2 milligrams orally or intramuscularly slash intravenously once a day. The usual dose is usually 1 to 2 milligrams orally per day. The effective dose range is 0.5 to 6 milligrams per day, and the maximum dose is 6 milligrams per day. Special considerations would be on a large prostate, irregular heartbeat, glaucoma, or risk factors for glaucoma, tardive dyskinesia, or urinary retention. Contraindications to benzodrapine include any allergy to the ingredient in benzodrapine, angle closure glaucoma, bleeding problems, esophageal echolasia, myasthenia gravis, intestinal or urinary blockage, or ulcerative colitis. Oral effects of this medication include dysphagia and xerostomia. Here's our dental overview. For the intraoral assessment, we can see that with a face, head, and neck, he only presented with generalized macules. The lymph nodes are submandibular palpable, and the TMJ presents with deviation at the right with crepitus at the left. The lips have angular colitis, and the mucosa has a bilateral linea alba with cheek biting present on the left side. He also has palatal, palatal tori, and the tongue is coated and presents with glossitis. Biofilm levels are calculus is generalized moderate, plaque is generalized heavy, and stain generalized moderate, and bleeding is generalized moderate. The occlusion is class 1 all the way around. For the PSR, the readings for the sections are as follow. First, 3. Second, 3. Third, 3. Fourth, 4. Fifth, 4. And sixth is 4. The dental charting for probing depths we observe generalized 3 to 4 millimeter pockets with localized 4 to 7 millimeter pockets at the posteriors, noted at 14, 15, 18, 19, 20, 30, 31, and 32. The clinical attachment loft 
loss is observed at 6, 11, 23 to 27, that is of one millimeter. And at 19, the mesial buckle for three millimeters. Recession observed is at 6, 11, 23 to 27 of one millimeter, and at number 19, or two millimeters. Restorative work, um, this patient has had a porcelain bridge placed at number 6 through 11, with 6 and 11 being abutments and 7 through 10 being pontex. Full porcelain crowns have been placed on 1 through 5, 12 through 16, 17 through 21, and 28 through 31, with porcelain veneers from 22 to 27. He is missing teeth 7 through 10. Uh, radiographically, we can see recurrent decay at number 19, mesial. Uh, fractured teeth is just fractured porcelain at the crown 32 occlusal and he has cheek biting once again present on the left side for any oral lesions. The gingival assessment. The gingival color is generalized diffuse moderate to severe redness. The gingival contour is generalized diffuse moderate bulbous papilla. Gingival consistency is generalized diffuse moderate spongy consistency and the gingival texture is a generalized diffuse moderate shiny texture. The gingival assessment statement is, the patient presents with generalized diffuse moderate to severe redness that has generalized diffuse moderately bulbous contour. The consistency is generalized diffuse moderately edematous, and the texture of the gingiva is generalized diffuse and moderately shiny. Here's our dental overview. Our patient's chief complaint is that he has bleeding gums and bad breath. The patient's opinion of the oral condition is that he knows that he has a lot of dental work done, feels bleeding and bad breath are absolutely attributed only to dental work. Our patient's last visit was in 2012, approximately four years ago. It was for a periodic exam, and at this appointment, the recommendations made were to replace crowns 19 and 32. The reasons for our patient leaving was he felt the office was taking advantage of him. Here are gingival images that represent uh, our current patient status. We can see in figure one that it does generalized diffuse, moderately pink, and fibrotic gingiva, generalized diffuse, moderately cratered papilla, and generalized diffuse, moderately eroded surface texture. In figure two, we have generalized diffuse, moderately pink fibrotic gingiva, generalized diffuse flattened papilla, generalized diffuse moderately shiny gingiva that appears moderately smooth and shiny. In figure three, we see generalized diffuse uh, severely red gingiva that is generalized diffuse severely bulbous. The consistency is diffuse severely edematous and generalized diffuse moderately shiny gingiva. In figure four, we see generalized diffuse moderately pink gingiva that is mo generalized diffuse moderately fibrotic with localized papillary edematous gingiva at localized bulbous areas. Localized marginal severe blunting of papilla at anterior with generalized diffuse moderately shiny gingiva. Figure five, we see generalized diffuse moderate erythematous gingiva with localized marginal severe redness at number nine and number 10 with generalized diffuse moderately bulbous and blunted papilla. Consistency is generalized diffuse severely edematous gingiva that is generalized diffuse with shiny texture. Figure six, generalized diffuse moderate pink gingiva that is fib generalized diffuse moderately fibrotic. The contour is generalized diffuse moderately flattened papilla with generalized diffuse mildly smooth and shiny gingiva. Here is a periodontal assessment. We can see clinical attachment once again observed at 6, 11, 23 to 27. We have a class two mobility and uh, grade two frication observed at numbers 19 and 32. To continue with our periodontal classification, here is our dental hygiene statement. Our patient presents with localized case type two mild periodontitis with generalized moderate periodontitis case type three exhibited generalized four to six millimeter pockets with generalized bleeding and generalized horizontal bone loss. The patient also exhibits localized severe periodontitis case type four with localized seven millimeter pockets, localized recession at 19 mesial buckle. Uh, tooth number 19 and 32 also present with grade two frication involvement in class two mobility, vertical bone loss exhibited radiographically at 19 mesial and 32 distal. We can see our periodontal classification includes Chronic periodontitis, localized early periodontitis, limited to number 6, 11, 23 to 27 for 28.5%. Generalized moderate periodontitis, limited to numbers 1 through 4, 12 through 16, 17 through 18, 20 through 22, and 28 through 31 for 64.2%. And localized severe periodontitis, limited to numbers 19 and 32 for 7.1%. Now here's our dental hy di hygiene diagnosis. 
Again, our patient presents with generalized moderate periodontitis case type 3, exhibiting generalized 4 to 6 millimeter pockets with generalized bleeding and generalized horizontal bone loss, 1 to 2 millimeters with attachment loss at 6, 11, 23 to 27 of 1 millimeter. Patient also exhibits localized severe periodontitis case type 4 with localized 7 millimeter pockets, localized attachment loss at number 19 of 2 millimeters, and tooth number 19 and 32 also present with grade 2 frication involvement and class 2 mobility, with vertical bone loss at 19 mesial and 32 distal. Our prognosis is good for all areas except for tooths number 6 through 11, I'm, I'm sorry, 6 and 11, 19, 23 to 27, and 32, with a rational, rationale due to adequate remaining bone support. It is fair for tooth number 6, 11, and 23 through 27, and a rationale due to attachment loss, and, number, and poor for tooth number 19 and 32, and a rationale due to class 2 mobility and grade 2 frication and attachment loss at number 19. For patient and treatment goals, our short-term goals, short goals for a patient include daily brushing twice a day for two minutes and daily flossing with a water flosser and reaching less than a 10% plaque index. For me, the clinician, is to reduce bleeding on probing, reduce all pocket depths to less than four millimeters, or reduction of one to two millimeters post-treatment at pocket depths four millimeters and above, and to provide OHI specific to the patient. The long-term goals include for the patient is habit formation of short-term goals, as in brushing and flossing, no digital bleeding and brushing when flossing, and commitment to recare. For the clinician, long-term goals are to return oral the oral cavity to healthy disease-free state, continuous improved home care, OHI at recare, and an established recare. Modifiable factors include home care, diet, hygiene aid use, reduction in pocket depths, 1 to 2 millimeters, and better OHI for the caregiver in addition to the patient. Non-modifiable factors include the dexterity restraints of Parkinson's disease, necessary medications, we need to maintain the crestal bone levels, and maintain periodontal status so disease does not progress. In our treatment plan, for appointment number one, we will do a comprehensive exam uh, that includes an FMX and intraoral images. At this time, we will present our treatment plan to the patient, and we can see here that the recommended treatment by the dentist was to go ahead and replace crowns at 19 and 32, and also provide SRP at the four quadrants with irrigation. We will split up the appointment so that the first appointment entails the left side that includes a crown replacement of number 19. Um, since the anesthesia will be provided for the upper left and lower left quadrants, we can go ahead and take advantage of the anesthesia provided at the lower left quadrant. And once again, we can go ahead and do the crown replacement of number 19. At this appointment, uh, we will use two carpules from a pivoting plane, uh, one at each quadrant. And after the crown restoration is performed, we will go ahead and perform, uh, the clinician will perform the SRP at both the upper left and the lower left with ultrasonics, hand scale, fine scale, root planing, and subgingival irrigation with chlorhexidine of 0.12%. Desensitizing agent is placed at root surfaces at 6, 11, and 23 to 27. Post-op inst post instructions were given to not chew on the left side until the anesthesia wears off. At this appointment, we will go ahead and dispense the food, di food diary for the nutritional analysis. And uh, we will go ahead and follow into the next appointment, which will be the SRP of the upper right and lower right with irrigation and uh, the crown replacement of number 32. At our appointment two, this will include performing the SRPs at the upper right and the lower right, but also replacing crown number 32. At this point, we can see a decrease in the plaque index level, and we praise the patient. I believe the previous one was 65%. We will continue to provide OHI to the patient and um, continue with the treatment indicated of the SRPs. Once again, the anesthesia provided uh, will give us anesthesia for the doctor to perform at the crown restoration at number 32, the lower right quadrant, as well as for the SRPs provided at the upper right and the lower right. At this appointment, we collect the food diary and um, also direct the patient for a six-week reevaluation. At that appointment, we will do a full mouth probing and uh, have a reassessment and provide a rest and placement at pockets five millimeter or greater, and also review the food diary. So at appointment three, this is our six-week six reevaluation. 
here after reviewing vitals, med, history, um, an intraoral exam is performed, and we take no observation of the tissue tone. Here we can see an overall improvement, an FMP full math probing will be performed. Um, we can see a localized Im overall improvement or with a one or two millimeter reduction, and localized specifically, um, it went from a six millimeter to a five millimeter at 31 distal buckle and seven millimeters to six millimeters at 19 mesial buckle and mesial lingual and number 32 distal buckle and distal lingual with no improvement observed at 31 distal lingual. The plaque index is continued uh, improvement. Now it's at 15%. We need to praise our patient for the continued improvement. Continue to give OHI instruction to both the patient and the caretaker. At this appointment, uh, based off of the tissue tone and the needs for the patient, ORCIX is recommended uh, for total patient comfort. We use one carpule and perform the periodontal maintenance with ultrasonics, hand scale, fine scale, root planing, and subgingival irrigation. At this appointment, we can place a rest in at the sites we deem uh, necessary, five millimeters and above. So we went ahead and placed it at 31 distal buccal, 19 mesial buccal, mesial lingual, and number 32 distal buccal, distal lingual, with post-op instructions to postpone brushing and flossing at sites treated with arrest in. So we will retreat number 31 distal lingual at the next visit. If no improvement uh, is seen, possible periodontal referral will be given at that appointment, or as indicated, polish and floss reformed, intraoral photos are taken, and a fluoride varnish is dispensed with post-op instructions. At this appointment, we can also provide nutritional analysis and counseling based off the food diary. Um, here we will provide sample use for meals that the patient at this appointment seems motivated to use. The next appointment will be a three-month recall and a nutritional reassessment. At our fourth appointment, <clears throat> this is a true periodontal maintenance. This is three months out. We perform the uh, full mouth probing always. And we can see that there's an overall tissue tone improvement and a one to two millimeter reduction in the sites affected at last visit with localized at four millimeters at 31 distal buccal, five millimeters at 19 mesial buccal, mesial lingual, and 32 distal buccal, distal lingual with no improvement at number 31 distal lingual. Yet the plaque index is now 10%. We can praise the patient for reaching the plaque index goal, but still remember to always give OHI instructions. At this appointment, we can administer one copy of or kicks throughout all quads for total patient comfort and perform the periodontal maintenance. A rest in is then placed at 19 mesial buccal mesial lingual, number 32 distal buccal distal lingual, and we can retreat number 31 at distal, distal lingual. Uh, once again, we will monitor thir number 31 distal lingual, and if no improvement persists, then we can consider a periodontal referral. Polish and floss is performed at this visit, and so is a fluoride varnish with post-op instructions. At this appointment, we can see that the nutrition analysis, the reassessment, um, the patient has provided that the meals were very helpful. The next visit will be continuously a three-month recall and a nutritional reassessment for patient needs. And here we can see the home care recommendations. We will send the patient home with a prescription dental aid of the chlorhexane gluconate rinse for its antimicrobial properties. Since our patient is experiencing glossitis, we can consider using a mouth mouthwash with diphenhydramine for pain associated with glossitis. Over-the-counter dental aids include biotine for xerostomia and xylitol-containing produ products. Xylitol-containing products for xerostomia as well, but we need to stay away from tro trochies due to the dysphagia that this patient presents. We will recommend a base treatment or bass treatment, bass technique with a power brush. This specifically because we want to choose a design with a larger diameter for better dexterity, or we can modify it with a tennis ball or a bike handle, etc. We would recommend a biotine dentifrice for this patient since xerostomia seems to be the largest um, side effect here. We'll use a pea size amount when brushing for caries prevention and xerostomia relief. For flossing, since this patient has dexterity issues, the water flosser gives us a larger diameter and will also provide subgingival irrigation. So we use this daily at 45 degrees towards the sulcus and for inter at the endoproximals for best overall biofilm removal. In addition to the water flosser, we can also give our patient a floss pick with an extended handle that either he can hold or his caretaker can hold, and it will be used as needed with the water flosser. Once again, for the mouth rinse, I would like my patient to stay on chlorhexidine gluconate until I um, have seen enough of improvement. Otherwise, we'll follow directions at, on the prescription label. Rinse your mouth with chlorhexidine gluconate twice daily after brushing your teeth. Make sure that you just use the dose, measure the dose using the cup provided with the medication. Switch the medicine in your mouth for at least 30 seconds and then spit it out. 
And for fluoride, although this patient does not present with a high caries risk, I would still like to treat the surfaces that are covered, well, that are not covered in porcelain that have enamel and also exposed root surfaces. This would include lingual aspects of 22 to 27 and the other root surfaces mentioned previously. Um, once again, wait 30 minutes before eating or drinking and wait six hours before brushing after your professional application. And since this patient suffers from alcoholism, um, we need to refrain from using products with alcohol or even essential oils. And for our nutrition analysis, once again, our patient has Parkinson's disease and suffers from alcoholism. We need to make sure that this patient includes high fiber foods such as vegetables, cooked dried peas, and uh, beans such as legumes or the family of legumes. We want this patient to choose whole grain foods such as bran, cereals, pasta, rice, and absolutely fresh fruit in the diet. More than anything, we want to choose foods that are low in saturated fat and cholesterol. And we want to omit foods that are actually high in protein due to the medication and foods that are high in concentrations of tyramine. We want to avoid uh, foods that are cured, fermented, or air dried meats or fish aged cheeses such as aged cheddar Swiss or blue cheeses such as camembert or fermented cabbage, sauerkraut, kimchi, soybean products including soy sauce and absolutely under no circumstance alcohol. Due to the nature of the medications any supplementation would have to be approved by a physician and more so with the medications we have to wait two hours after taking the medications before incorporating any kind of supplementation.